Well, good morning again. It's uh, good to see all of you. I'm reflecting on those songs. Speak to us and each of us will listen with a receptive heart. I pray now that you and you alone lead us. In the name of Jesus, amen. I start off with a pretty morbid subject here. But have you ever been to a funeral where it just seems like you didn't exactly know what he was going to say about that? I don't know if you've ever seen that happen. I can remember going to a funeral a few years ago, and I really felt for the man that was speaking. I mean, he was trying to think of something to say good about the guy, but he asked, well, if that could happen at the end of our life, right? But you know, I've also been to funerals where I can remember I knew the person well, and, the, and pretty much the message that was shared about that life was, they were full of life. They had a lot of laughter. They had a lot of fun. And it was all true. I, I laughed myself during the funeral, having memories of things about them. But you know, I don't think, I tried to remember, maybe I missed it, but I don't think there was hardly anything said about that funeral about them following Jesus about anything about God being the center of their life. They basically made me feel good. I felt great when I walked out of there. The laughter and the memories of that laughter. I want to ask you again. Is that what you, what you want at the end of your life? I'll give you a couple of other examples. I thought about being at one, and I still wonder if the pastor meant to say this. It was a packed room at this funeral I was at. I knew the man very well. And the pastor said essentially something like these words like, he could have done so much with his life. And I thought, oh, I don't know if he really meant to say that. But you know what? Just about everybody in that whole room went, amen. They knew it. They knew the message of that man's life was he had tons of talent. He knew about God and he wasted his life. And everybody in the room here, I knew it, sitting there. Wow. Don't want that to be the message of my life. Last story for now. But you know, when I was in high school, I uh, was in a church, about 7,500 people. And uh, we had a youth group there that just, we, some of us today still stay in touch with one another. It just form a bond there, and we had a leader there. Her name was Mertilla. I don't know if you ever know. That's the only person I've ever known named Mertilla. M-Y-R-T-I-L-L-A, -L -L Mertilla. And Mertilla, if you met her, she's got a smile about this wife. You know what I mean? I mean, energy all over the place. You couldn't help but like her. You couldn't help but be attracted to her. You wanted to sit down and talk with her. They had three children. Her and her husband just poured their lives into us. I mean, if there was a Christian activity anywhere within probably 50 miles, we were going to it. You know, if we needed to stop and talk at 8.30 at night, walk on in, there's probably some homemade cookies there. You know, it was great. But it didn't stop there. She invested in my life the rest of my life. I wrote her a letter later in my adult years telling her thank you. She came to Kentucky not long before she died. And I was happy that she was staying in our house for a few days. But if you met her 10 years after I had out of high school and just saw her, guess what she wanted to know about? Jesus. She wanted to know about how you're doing with Jesus. Are you following Jesus? Her whole life was about telling other people about Jesus. She was involved in some kind of Christian ministry for other people to know about Jesus. What do you think the message of her life was? How can we say a few things and not be here for the next five hours at her people? You know what I mean? Because there were so many ways she impacted life after life. A few years ago, I spoke at a church, the church she was at. I was thankful and appreciative. They asked me to come speak there. And afterwards, you know how bad it was. We got together and had some good food together. And all of us young people started comparing notes. And you know, one of the guys says, you know, she impacted a lot of lives. Why? Wow. Small church, middle of nowhere in Mississippi. Some people might think, oh, what were they doing with their life? I can't what they were doing. Follow Jesus. 
probably already know right now what I'm going to ask you. What's going to be the message of your life? What's going to be the message of each one of our lives? And you see, you might think, oh, Wayne, it doesn't apply to me. Yes, it does. Every person that hears my voice right now, we will all leave a witness. We will all leave a testimony. We will all leave a legacy. We will leave a message for our life. And I want you to stop right now. What will be the message of my life? Life. And you may think, well, wait, I, I don't know if that really applies to me. Listen, we all leave a message. Some leave a message of saying, accumulate as much stuff as you can. And be, you know, super happy with all of these things and stuff. And have the biggest bank account. Have the most cars. And have the biggest home. And the nicest vacation. And this camper. And this boat. And this whatever. You know, I, I, I can't think of all the things we like to accumulate. But it's lots of stuff. You know? And some of us. At the end of our life, that's our message. I go for stuff. That shouldn't be our message. Some people go through life and they're passionate about their hobby. They absolutely love their hobby. They have all this money invested in that area. And anybody that talks to them, they know it. Or some people are absolutely crazy about their sports team. And everybody knows that. The first thing, if you mention their name, they know their sports team and who they're associated with. I was down in South Georgia one time and I walked in this whole room. It might have been more than a room. Everything in there is red and black for the University of Georgia. And everything about what he wanted to talk about was Georgia. He had decided. The message of my life, Georgia. I want to ask you, what will be the message of your life? What will be the message of your life generation after generation if the Lord tarries? You can open your Bibles to Acts chapter 6. We're going to look at a guy today that we introduced last week. A guy named Stephen. And it's really interesting what God did in Scripture. In Scripture, if you've got your Bible open in Acts 6, it starts there in verse 5. This guy's introduced, Stephen. And the rest of the chapter is pretty much talking about Stephen. And you go to chapter 7, and that whole chapter is either his sermon, excuse me, or his life. Everything, God just likes, puts a pause. He's been telling us all about the church growth and telling us about the church exploding. And he goes, stop. I want you to see the message from this life, this one life, Stephen, a Hellenistic person based on his name. We don't really know everything about him except what's recorded, but God just chose to show us these things, but he zeroed in on that life. And I'll tell you, you'll see in chapter 7, we're going to see his death. That's also kind of rare in Scripture to show the detail that we see here on Stephen's life. But God says, wait a minute, church, I want you to see this man Stephen. I want you to stop and look and it's life. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to do it kind of fast. We're going to just walk through chapter 6 and 7. I won't go through the whole sermon. It does show us that there is a place for a long sermon, by the way. It starts in verse 2 and all the way to verse 53 there in chapter 7. But we won't do that today either. But we're going to look at some characteristics of his life. The first thing I'll tell you about Stephen, that doesn't look, sound like a very theological term, but he's just flat full of Jesus. And you know what? When I say that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When everybody talked with him, he knew Jesus. Open up your Bibles and let me just show you. I refresh your memory last week, chapter 6, verse 5. You remember they had a problem in the church and they said, the apostles said, go pick some men that the message of their life is people of good reputation, people full of the Holy Spirit. And it tells us in verse 5 of chapter 6, if you're reading along right there, it says, they chose Stephen. A man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit. You remember we looked at that last week. Those of you that weren't here, we took a brief look at that. He was a man that trusted God, full of the Holy Spirit. The word full there, if you remember, we talked about. It's like full right up to the brim of a coffee cup. Just, just right at the point of spilling over. That word full there is just fullness to the absolute every cell of your body. 
He says he's full of Jesus. He's full of the Holy Spirit of God. And we talked about that last week, so we won't stay there today. But you go down to verse 8. And after it talks about the church exploding with growth, God says, hold on. Let me just tell you about this guy, Stephen. And Stephen, in verse 8, says, And Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Another characteristic of his life, he's full of grace. He's full of God's power. Now, it's also something very unusual. When we talk about these unique miracles and signs of healing and things that happened in the early church that seemed to show God's hand upon those leaders, it usually was just the apostles. But there were a few exceptions in one of them, Stephen. Stephen, God says, I also put my hand on your life where you'll actually do miracles there in that early church there in the city of Jerusalem. But he's a man full of grace. What does it mean to be full of grace? It means that when people dealt with Stephen, he showed the grace of God. He was kind. He was gentle. He dealt with people well. Now, you'll see in a minute, he's also very bold and very direct. But he was a man that dealt graciously with people. He showed the love of God from his life. He showed that God's hand had been all over him and the power of God was on him. You know what that is the message of your life? Oh, by the way, do you see here in Scripture? The only thing that's said about Stephen is pick somebody. Oh, we'll pick him. He's full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, here's another Scripture. He's full of grace and full of power. Keep reading. Verse 9. What happens every time we see somebody in the full of Jesus? The devil rises his head. And we see here in verse 9 that some men from what was called the synagogue of the freedmen, including both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, you can keep reading there. There's this group of people there, and it even uses the word there. It says they argued with Stephen. Now, in some of your Bibles that might not use the word argue, it really is the word debate there. They were just having dialogue. And you go, well, who are these guys that are the freedmen? Sounds like the Masons or something, you know. Now, basically, what it's saying there is it's talking about Jewish slaves that we know were freed in the century before Christ, and they formed their synagogue. And in fact, you might not know this, but if you were to go look at the city of Jerusalem at that time, there would have been a bunch of synagogues. It's like us today, you know, where you got... This Baptist church and another Baptist church. And they had synagogues all over the city. Groups, you might be in other words, or people in the Judaism. And they're saying, Stephen, you're wrong. Jesus is not the Messiah. And Stephen is saying, no, Jesus is the one. He's the promise all the way from the Old Testament. Well, look at the next verse there in verse 10. But they were unable to cope with the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. Sound like Jesus to you? Even when Jesus was 12 years old in the temple? That's him. They couldn't say, man, we can't do anything with this guy Stephen. He's bold and clear and wise. He knows the word of God. You're going to see all the way through chapter 7. He's a man. In chapter 7, you know what he did? He stood up in front of a group of people. It appears he had no notes, no scripture, no nothing. And he pretty much gives an overview of the whole Old Testament right off the top of his head. He is flat, full of God. That's your introduction to Stephen. So you say, what do I take away from all of that? Well, read on just to see one or two more quick things about him. They couldn't be in a debate. So in verse 11, it says, They secretly induced men to say, We have heard, speak, heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Down there in verse 13, they put forth false witnesses. What did they do? They said, we just lie about it. We just start making up stories, and we'll lie about it. If you're a note taker, John 8, 44, what does it tell us about the devil? The devil is the father of lies. So what should we expect? When people attack, there's lies involved. And they start making false accusations. And they start saying, oh, no, he's against Moses. He's against the tabernacle. He's against anything of Judaism. This guy hates the law. This guy stands for Jesus, and Jesus wants to destroy us. They're accusing him right and left. What would be your response? Anybody ever accused you? You ever get mad? Look what he did. Look at the very last verse of chapter 6. And fixing their gaze on him, all who were sitting in the council, this would be the religious leaders of that day, saw his face like that of an angel. What? I can sit here and try to preach it, but I can tell you, I don't really know exactly what that looked like. 
We know that Moses glowed with the face of God after he saw God in the Old Testament. Was it like that? Possibly. Was it something that we don't know, but I'll tell you what, it's recorded in Scripture here that it was unique and everybody knew God's hand was all over Stephen and he's calm, cool, and collected, not rattled a bit, not worried about it at all. They can yell and scream and curse and anything else they want to do. He's God's man. He clearly identified with him. You go, how can a man be like that? How can a guy be like that? All we know is this, is he invested in pursuing God. And you go, wait, how do you know that? A man full of the Holy Spirit, a man that could handle the Scriptures well, a man that could stand up before the religious leaders of that day and just calmly handle himself and never even get rattled. Let me tell you, if you want to put it in 2022 terms, he knew this. He held on to the Word of God, just rock solid in the Word. He's a man that walked with God. If right then, Stephen would have dropped dead, what would have been the message of Stephen's life? He followed God. He stood for God. They already selected people out of the whole group there in the church, and they said, let's pick the people who are full of the Holy Spirit. Stephen, he's one of them. Is that the message of your life? Is that what people would say about me and you today? Don't you want that to be the message of our life today? I mean, if I went around the room right now, I would almost guess, I mean, we're here at church on Sunday morning. Most people would say, hey, I want to be identified with Jesus. I want to be a person for God. I want to be a person that leaves a legacy for my children and grandchildren and people that know me. I want to be a person that when I go to heaven, Jesus says, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want it. Let's go back to slide. Are you investing in that? Is that the pursuit of your life? Where's your time go? Y'all know what I mean by that? Is there some TV shows that you're like, I gotta watch all of them, but I'll have to be in scripture. I gotta go pursue these particular things that I really enjoy doing. I got a friend that he probably has. I don't know. The last time I was with him, I think it was 38. I guess now it's over 40. His wife now has to kind of side off on how many guns he gets. <laughs> but what's he crazy about? That. He's a lot of fun to go shoot with. But what is the pursuit of his life? I can't say it's here. Where is your investment? What will be and what is? The message of my life. I want you to see a couple other things about him as we move along. You're going to get to the best part of the story at the end of chapter 7, but I've got to set the stage. So here's what's happening. If you've got your Bible open, look at what happens. It's pretty amazing. The high priest says, it's like he turns to Stephen and goes, is that so? And it's almost like Stephen doesn't even blink. It's like the Spirit of God just energizes him what would you have done? I probably would have spoke up and said, those are all lies. That's not true. He didn't even worry about defending himself. What did he worry about? I want you to know about God. I want you to know about God's work in us, and I want you to know about Jesus. And that's the only message that he chose to proclaim. He didn't even worry about himself. He worried about sharing the message of God. He's a guy that was solid in his faith. He was a guy resting in God's promises, and he was ready. Go just trust God and look at the messages for a sermon. Now listen, I'm not going to go chase all 52 verses in this sermon, okay? So you might want to read it, but I'm going to give you a summary. It's an amazing thing. He stood up like me standing here in front of you right now, and notice how he starts there in verse 2. He goes, hear me, brethren and fathers. First of all, he's kind to them. He calls them his brothers. He even says they're the God of glory. He's talking about the God of the Jewish people. He goes, he appeared to our father, Abraham. And then he just begins to roll. He goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 11. In Genesis 11, it says Abraham is in the earth of Chaldees. And all of a sudden, God calls Abraham out. He says, Abraham, I'm sending you to a land. You don't even know where you're going. And he tells Abraham, you're going to have descendants on top of descendants, sand like the seashore. And if you're looking along in the story there, it tells us they're down there in about verse... 
Let's see if I find it. In verse 6, he says, hey, Abraham, you're going to have a whole bunch of descendants. And guess what? All those descendants, they're going to leave this land that I promised you. And they're going to go to a foreign land. And they're going to be slaves. And you know, most of you may not know this story. Do you know that when God told that to Abraham, Abraham didn't have any descendants? Do you hear me I mean, he's like, Abraham, you're going to have a whole bunch of descendants. And Abraham's going, where are they? And he goes, after you have all these descendants, they're not even going to be in this land that I promised you. They're going to go to a foreign land, and they're going to be slaves. And they're going to be there for a certain amount of time. God shared all of that in advance. And he says, after they're there for this amount of time, they'll be delivered and brought back to the land of promise. Why'd God do that? Well, we don't know everything about God's mind, but we do know one thing. And this is a key for your life and my life. He knew God is sovereign and completely in control of all things and everything. And all through this whole sermon, he says stuff like this. He goes, God brought Abraham, people sent to Egypt, Joseph into captivity. He goes, and God raised up a man. Nobody knew what was going on. There was this man, Moses. And Moses was 40 years with Pharaoh. And then 40 years in captivity. And he says, and, oh, not captivity, 40 years in the desert. And then in verse 30, he goes, after those 40 years had passed, he says, okay, it's time, Moses. He's 80 years old. He said, it's time for you to go face the most powerful man in your world, the leader of Egypt, and to go stand before him and to lead two million people, hauling them out God's promise. But what is Stephen trying to say here? He says, listen, all through that, God is saying, I'm in control. I've got a plan. I put in the law. I put in the sacrifices. I showed the shedding of blood. Every one of them pointed to Jesus Christ. He comes down to the story, and down there in verse 40, he says, and my people would always go away from me. They would go build a golden calf. And then you keep reading the story, and then he brings up Joshua there in verse 45. He says, God gave him the land with Joshua. And then in verse 46, he brings up David. I mean, see, he started in Genesis. He's already over there in the first and second second. I mean, it's like he's just preaching a sermon. Don't tell me that Stephen's not a person who's a student of the Word of God. He knew it. And he stands up there, and what's his message of his life? He said, God has had a plan of salvation throughout the ages. If you're sitting here today, salvation isn't something made up by Baptists. Salvation isn't something made up by religious people. It's straight from God. And he is telling us all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 when the first sin occurred that God gave the projection in Genesis 3 verse 15 that there will be a Savior. And all through the Old Testament, that's the message that he's trying to tell those people right there all through this sermon. Don't you see God is at work? And Jesus is the fulfillment of that. And he says, you guys are caught up in tradition. You guys are caught up in religion. You guys are caught, let's put it in today's term, you're caught up in being a good Baptist, or you name your denomination. And he says, you're caught up in all your denominational rules and regulations. He says, no. He says, God's not a God of tradition. Not a God of religion. He says it there in verse 48 in chapter 7. He says, the most high does not dwell in houses made by human hands. What's he saying? Hey, we come together this morning to worship God. And we sometimes say, hey, we're going to church. The church is us and the Holy Spirit living in us. God wants a relationship. And we mess it all up. I mean, we go in church and people think today infants need to be baptized. And that's going to mean something for them for eternity. It doesn't. We think some people need to go be baptized and they'll be saved. And water doesn't save you. And we think that, you know, we need to do this, 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 and this, and we'll be saved. No, we can't save ourselves. And he's even trying to get at that with these guys saying, guys, you're trying to follow rules. Rules don't get it. You're saved by grace. Jesus Christ, that's why he came and died on the cross, because we couldn't save ourselves. comes back in his story and he reminds them Jesus is the only answer. 
But what's the characteristic of Stephen's life? He's got such a relationship with God. It doesn't bother him at all to stand up and all the religious leaders of that day. He doesn't bother him at all to stand up and boldly proclaim Jesus and to tell them, you got your Bible open? Look at what happens. This is the best part of the story. Look at verse 51. Now remember, he's a guy full of grace. But look what he says. He says, you men, I think he was saying it about like that. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine if somebody said that to you? You're going to see here in just a minute. In verse 54, it says, When they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But I want you to look just a little bit more about what he told them. He says in verse 52, Which one of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? He's talking about people like Isaiah and Jeremiah and Amos and Obadiah, all these Old Testament prophets. He goes, They were rejected over and over and over by your forefathers. And he comes there and he goes, they killed those who had previously announced the coming of the, there it is, the righteous one. You see what he's saying? Jesus Christ is the only one that was righteous. The blood of bulls, the blood of goats, the blood of calves, none of that will save you. The only way you're going to be saved is through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And he goes, you murdered and betrayed Jesus. Woo! So in verse 54, have you ever seen somebody bad and the veins in their neck are just popping out? That's my interpretation of that verse. Have you ever seen where their face gets just red as a beet? And maybe if they're holding something like this, they're white knuckling it. I mean, that's the description of verse 54. They're mad. They're going to rip his head off. But I want you to see this man, Stephen, doesn't even flinch. He does not even worry about that. He worries about his Lord. He worries about the message that he is to proclaim. He's decided in his life, the message of my life, Jesus. The message of my life, it's all about Jesus. That's what Stephen is trying to say here. If you read in the story... God does something rather unique here in Scripture. It shows the events of his death. We're going to talk about it. As we talk about the message of our life, I want you to hear this. We have to be ready for earthly death. Stephen was not even worried about death. Now, that may seem crazy to you. Some people really start freaking out when death confronts them. People get nervous. People get scared. I've seen people that start worrying. I can remember different people through my life. But I've also seen people like Mr. Debilineuf. He had one of those Cajun names when I lived down in South Louisiana. He had cancer. It was bad. He was in pain. I mean, pain. You know what I heard about him in the hospital? I see everybody that walks in his room, even though he's in pain, he says, hold on, I need to tell you about Jesus. <laughs> and it didn't surprise me, because I've known him for a long time. He wouldn't worry about death. He's like, I need to tell a few more people about Jesus before I take my last breath. He's ready. Is that the message you like? Now we're going to wrap up here, but don't, don't miss this part of the story. It's the best. They're mad. They're rip-roaring mad. And Stephen doesn't say, hey guys, hold on. I don't want to make anybody mad here. No. In verse 55, but being full of the Holy Spirit, oh by the way, don't miss it. The Lord records that more than once about Stephen in Scripture. He wants us to see clearly. He is not self-centered. He's God-centered. That's where we must be. He gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Now that's an amazing thing. God apparently let heaven open up there before Stephen, right there before all of these guys that are mad as hornets at him. And we're about to see the death of Stephen. What does it tell us? Why was he not afraid? Why was he not scared? He knew these guys, their tradition would be to stone people. 
He knew that they would kill people. Why was he not worried about it? Hear me. If we have our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ died on the cross and paid for our sin, death has no hold on the believer. In this passage, look at the last words there in chapter 7. And they talk about Stephen's death. It says, he fell asleep. Isn't that great? Scripture said, he just fell asleep. And when his eyes opened up, our spirit moved, and that's a better way to say it, straight into heaven. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says, once we die, we're in the presence of the Lord. Those who are saved by grace. If you're looking for some comfort, give me, I'll give you two or three verses real quick. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55. You've all heard it. What does it say? Oh, death, where is your sting? Oh, death, where is your victory? It's not there. In 1 Corinthians 15, verse 57, it says, But thanks be to God, who has given us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He's like, death has no hold. In this room right now, if you're concerned about death and dying, stop and say, where's my faith? Stephen's like, my home's in heaven. My home's in eternity. And he says there in verse 55, he looks up and he sees Jesus. He sees God. In verse 56, he, six, he yells out. He goes, Behold, I see the heavens open. He says this in front of these guys. And he says, And the Son of Man, and when he said that word, it was like an eruption in the room, standing at the right hand of God. That word, Son of Man, is the same word that Jesus used to describe himself in Matthew chapter 26. Probably, not probably, some of those same people there in the room had already heard this before. And they're like, ah! That's what it means in the next verse. That's my interpretation. But if you read it, it says, They cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears. You ever feel like you're saying to somebody, I don't want to hear it anymore. They're like, shut up, be quiet, leave me alone, I'm just going to kill you. They rushed him out of the city there in the next verse there, in verse 58. And they began throwing rocks at him. That was the way of death. But as Stephen said, hold on just a minute, guys. I'll go with you. Quit throwing the rocks. Notice what he says there in verse 59. He cries out to the Lord Jesus. And he says, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. I'm ready to go home. In Philippians 3.20 it says our citizenship is in heaven. That's exactly where Stephen was. He said, my home is heaven. Lord Jesus, bring me home. You want to have a message from your life? It's all about Jesus. Our focus has to be on eternity. Folks, my struggle, your struggle, our struggle, we want to focus on everything in this world. Y'all agree with me? We can sit here on Sunday morning and we will sit here and we will say, Amen, brother. But all the things that take our energy, our time, our talents, our money, our life, we tend to invest it here. We tend to invest in things and none of it is going to matter. You notice that the Lord doesn't tell us one thing in this passage of Scripture about Stephen's wealth, about Stephen, anything else about his family. The only thing that God wants you to see about him is he loved Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, ready to go to heaven. And I didn't tell you there's other little phrase you've got to see there. You see there in verse 55 and 56, it says Jesus was standing. Those of you that are Bible scholars, is that not a unique word in Scripture? That's unique. You know why it's unique? Because almost everywhere else when we see Jesus in heaven, what does it say? Seated. Y'all remember? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Go through the whole book of Hebrews. It says it over and over in Hebrews. It says He is seated at the right hand of the Father. It is finished. The work is done. It even says there He's waiting on the return to come as the victorious one. Here, uniquely in Scripture, it says, the Lord Jesus stands. 
Why? Jesus is saying, come home. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know what I want for your life and my life? It's not only here on earth for people to know our testimony for Jesus, but our testimony and the message of our life will be that. And then Jesus says, well done. Come on home. I want you to stop and ask yourself, is that what your life is? As we come to an end today, we have to stop and ask ourselves this. What are the priorities of my life? Is it stuff? Is it activities? Is it some hobbies? Is it just my personal comfort and convenience? Or is it Jesus? And I'll tell you this. The only thing that matters? Jesus. Stephen got it. A lot of us don't. I say that in love, but we don't. So we've come to a point that I want you to stop and think about. What will be the message of your life? When your life ends, what will be your legacy? Will it be trinkets? Or will it be Jesus? Far too often, we go for the wrong thing. I want you to really stop and think about that right now. What is your life really invested in? You can be 15 years old, you can be 95 years old. Age doesn't even play into this. It's like, where is my life? Do I play around with Jesus? Is Jesus just something that is like, it's a good thing, I'll go to church on Sunday, I might even open up my Bible every now and then. Or is Jesus the center of your life? Is Jesus what your life's about? You see, we've gotten all off track in the church. We really have. We think Jesus is kind of a sideline activity in our life, and we can kind of just pull Jesus in when it's comfortable, or He helps us when we have a crisis in our life. But it's not like He's tops, number one. But you know what? Go read the Bible. It never tells us that he's a sideline activity. It says he's number one, the passion of our life. So today, if you're a believer in Christ, I want you to stop and ask yourself, where is my life, my priorities in my life? There's also people here in the room. I might ask you this question. What does eternity look like for you? Can you say with confidence like Stephen did? He goes, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He knew where his home was. He knew who his Savior was. He knew exactly where his eternal home was. Is that your answer? Sometimes I'll talk to people about, say, hey, what would happen if you died tonight or are you going to heaven when you die? Or do you have a relationship with God? And people say stuff like, well, I hope so. You ever heard that? Maybe you're thinking that right now. That's not a good answer. Or you might think, well, I really would hope that, you know, I've done enough things in my life that I'll make it in. Might, might be close, but I think I'll make it. I've had those conversations before. That's not a good answer. You say, oh, by the way, you're never good enough. I don't care what you've done. You're not. Me either. Eternity looks like this. And Stephen gives a clear picture of it in his death. It's an eternal home in heaven because only a faith in Jesus Christ is the payment for your sin. Or there's hell. It's just that straight and direct. I want you to bow your heads. I'm actually just maybe moving right on an invitation here, but just bow your heads. I, I just want you to stop and think right now. This message, it should speak to every heart in this room, every one of us. 
I want you to just pause for a minute and ask, is Jesus my Savior? If I die tonight, will I be in heaven? Good gracious, this should make you be confronted with that message. We all want to be like Stephen and say, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. But it's only through faith in Jesus Christ. I invite you today, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, you can talk to me here in just a minute as we offer you an invitation. You can fill out the card on your pew there that says welcome. And on the back of that card, you can put your name and just say, hey, I need to talk to somebody. I'll contact you this week. You can give that card to one of us there in the four years you leave. But I invite you to ask yourself, is Jesus my Savior? But I want to talk to those right now who say, I've been saved by His grace. I want you to have your head bowed. I want you to think right now and ask yourself, is Jesus the Lord and boss of my life? Is He top priority? When people see my life, do they know Jesus or do they know something else? And if it's anything else other than Jesus, today should be a day of repentance. Today should be a time of saying, Lord, I repent. You need to be king and Lord and boss of my life. And He's not. Hey, let's not play church this morning. Bow your heads and get serious with God. You see, right now, when we hear Scripture like we hear about the man Stephen, it should cause us to stop. Now, we're not going to play any music for just a moment. I want you to just have a time of silence. I want every person in this room to have your head bowed. And I want you to just do business with God. If you don't know Him as your Savior, you can come and talk to me right now. We don't have to stand up to have an invitation. If you need to pray to God right now, and I think there's probably a minute to do, right now our invitation needs to be do business with God. Pray. Repent. but I'll just reiterate it. If you need to talk to someone about Jesus as your Savior, I invite you to do that today. You can fill out a card and leave it with us. You can call me. My phone number's in the church bulletin. If you want to join our church, feel free. I'll talk to you today about that. But here's what I really want you to hear. Don't ignore the message that God has laid on your heart right now. People just file out and aren't listening to what God tells them. Listen to what God's saying. <laughs> 